In 2018, CJ Tudor emerged onto the horror writing scene with their haunting debut, The Chalkman. A hypnotically creepy story which won both the International Thriller Writers and Strand Magazine Awards for Best Debut Novel was compared by critics to Stephen King's best work. Even the master of the horror genre himself saw the parallels, saying, if you like my stuff, you'll like this. Born in Salisbury and raised in Nottingham, Tudor was reading and writing terrifying tales from a young age. But like most authors, CJ took a long and winding road to publication, working variously as a trainee reporter, waitress, a radio scriptwriter, a shop assistant, a voiceover artist, a television presenter, and dog walker, before finding success as a novelist. She followed her debut with the equally chilling The Taking of Annie Thorne, and her latest brilliant and terrifying thriller, The Other People, arrived earlier this year. With each new release, the woman with the pixie cut and the macabre imagination continues to win fans and cost people sleep. Open a CJ Tudor novel, and from the first page it is clear that she's quickly becoming the standard the other people are chasing. We're definitely uh, uh, huge fans, and we're going to toast to CJ Tudor coming yeah. on the show. Okay, excellent. I've got my gin. <laughs> Beautiful. I actually, I'm, there I'm you going go. with tea. I'm going with tea. o'clock in this house. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, CJ, you seem to come out of nowhere to, and, and, to write some of the best horror fiction out there. But there's more oh, to the story. You. you didn't just pop up out of nowhere with no, an ability no. to scare readers. So where did CJ Tudor come from? Uh, you are writing your own origin story right now. So give us the opening chapter. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> it all started a long, long time ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they warned us not to say that. <laughs> it really is. I've been writing. I mean, like most writers, I've been writing since I was a kid. Yeah. Um, but then I just kind of let it go. Well, I, I, you know, I think I never thought that sort of with, with my background, I left school at 16 as well, and I loved writing, but I think I never thought that I could become an author. That seemed a really far away thing that kind of like rich people in London kind of did. Right. And so, but I, so I kind of tried to get into jobs that were to do with writing, like I was a trainee journalist and I worked in advertising and, and copywriting and that sort of stuff. Um, but I was always writing in the background. And then when I was in my 30s, early 30s, probably, I thought, oh, you know, if I'm going to try and, you know, do this publishing book thing, I need to finish something for a start um, and see if it's any good. And so I sort of knuckled down to try and finish something and it wasn't any good. It was absolutely rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> and I put that <laughs> but I kind of proved I could get to the end of something because I was a great right. starter. And then I'd like go, no, 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 and I've got a better idea and then I'd do something else. <laughs> um, so it kind of proved I could kind of plow on through to the end. Um, and then, yeah, I wrote a couple more things and then I eventually got an agent in my mid thirties, but that didn't really work out. I was so mm. excited to get an agent cause it's really tough. Um, but they really wanted me to write straight crime and I kept going a bit Stephen King on them. So I'd sort of kind of like write something and then they try and cut out all the kind of horror supernatural stuff. And I'd be like, but that's the bit I loved. <laughs> that was the yeah, part that's not me. So, yeah. And so eventually that, that didn't work out and I left them. And at the time I thought, oh my, because they're a good agent, you know, they have quite a lot of high profile authors. And I thought, oh my God, this is, is this the stupidest thing that I have ever done? Um, and then it, it, might, it, might, it might well have been because I sort of was in the wilderness for several years, just sort of writing, publishing a few short stories and things. Um, but then fortunately, I sort of kept at it. And then, you know, the idea for the chalk man did kind of come out of nowhere. It was because someone gave my little girl some colored chalks for her second birthday. Um, and she wanted to draw stick figures on the driveway. Uh. And, and that was kind of where the idea came from, going out, you know, late at night, opening the door later to let the dog out and seeing all these stick figures drawn all over the driveway that I'd forgotten about that looked really creepy in the dark. Nice. And it literally yeah, was yeah. me saying to my husband, wow, these chalk men look really creepy in the dark. And it was <laughs> that kind of light bulb moment. And, and yeah, and I started writing the book the next day. But it was weird because I think I got to the point there because I say I had my daughter and I was at that point running a dog walking business because I liked dogs and it fitted around my little girl. And I'd actually thought maybe the whole writing thing isn't going to happen. You know, maybe I've sort of had my shot and that's it. 
Hmm. But then the chalk idea, it seemed such a fun idea and I could use all the stuff I loved, like all the stuff to do the 80s and sort of, you know, the homage to sort of Stephen King and, and things. And it just seemed too good an idea not to write. But I didn't really still have any expectations I would get published because I'd been knocked back so many times before. I yeah. kind of used to rejection by that point, but I thought, well, you know, let's give it one more shot. Yeah, well, that's a common theme, I think, for a lot of folks, really. It was well, it, over, it well over a decade from sort yeah. of trying to knuckle down and write that first awful book. <laughs> but so, TJ, now those, 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 those Chalkman stick figures, um, you people, would, uh, they pop up everywhere now. It's uh -huh. so cool. <laughs> see like kids doing it anywhere like when I was a kid that, that again that kind of was back to my childhood we used to draw with chalk on the on the pavements and stuff yeah yeah, yeah sure so it kind of sort of tied up with that whole sort of kind of childhood game turning quite sinister um and, and yeah and you never really know what's going to be the idea that actually yeah. a publishers or agents imagination and and I sort of feel I was very lucky because I didn't really change what I was writing. I had always written sort of mysteries with a bit of horror, kind of supernatural. But my previous agent just said to me, you know, several years before, there's no way a publisher will take this. <laughs> not going to happen. They're not They're lost. In anything that's <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Um, but then things kind of changed and it was sort of timing. There's a lot to do with it, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Boy. So we've kind of touched on family and, and children and yeah. all of us, all of us on the podcast here have, have kids. Um, so one of the themes that seem to follow your books is someone is missing. Um, and yes. as a parent, that's uh, probably all of us will say that's could be one of our greatest fears of oh, something yeah. happening. Yeah. Something happens to our kids, but if our kids are actually missing, cause then you're, you know, what happened? Um, so tell us, why did you gravitate or why do you gravitate towards those themes and or maybe are you secretly facing your own greatest fear in, in, in writing and what you're putting in a story? I think you are to an extent, aren't you? You're always, I don't sort of believe in write what you know because that would be extremely dull. Um, in one <laughs> but, but I think you do draw on, on, on your own fears and your own experiences. The Chalk Man was very much about my own kind of pre-teen years and childhood growing mm -hmm. up in a small suburban village in the UK. Um, and, you know, I was able to, to bring in a lot of my memories and things that, you know, me and my friends used to do in, in the 80s and use a lot of that. And it was revisiting sort of all the stuff I loved about that time in some ways. But, of course, putting in something a little bit creepier around it all. <laughs> um, and Annie Thorne, that my second book, in a way, was, was sort of about my kind of where I used to go to school um, in some regards, the small pit village where I went to school. And again, it was putting, you know, bullying experiences of teachers, all of those sort of things. And then the other people, yeah, now I have a little girl. Um, mm -hmm. It's that greatest fear of any parent, I think, isn't it? That something happens yeah. to your child. In fact, even the title was because I think I was, I was it sort of books come from lots of different places, I think, lots of little ideas merge into one. Um, and I was reading something, I think it's in a newspaper about something awful that had happened to, some of those awful random things that had happened to a, to a child. And, and you read it, you think, oh my God, that's awful. You know, thank goodness mm -hmm. it hasn't you know, happened to me. And, but I think we all kind of kid ourselves though. We all live in this sort of denial that our children, our family are, are almost like protected. Mm -hmm. that, that that bad stuff won't ever happen to us. It always right. happens to other people. Um, and that was part of the idea, I think, in the other people as well, you know, that, that of course that's not true. You know, and it, we could be the other people. You know, we could be that person, the story in the newspaper at any time. And it was very much sort of drawing upon that, that, that fear, that denial we all have that, you know, that nothing will happen to our sort of loved ones. Um, right. so yeah, I think it is very much drawing on sort of those darkest fears and putting them down on the page sometimes. Yeah, well, um, there was an attempt on my son uh, at his bus stop a couple of about a year and a half ago and so i i lived through that and i can tell you yeah. it can happen to anyone in any yeah. in, in any economic uh situation yeah um so that hit home with me pretty big well let's it stay with that kind of that dark twisted um kind of theme uh do you have to get your mind in a proper state of mind when you sit down to write or do you kind of filter along that edge uh and just naturally do you have to put yourself there or you kind of do you kind of that moment there? I, I find it quite easy to to dip in and out of the the sort of the the books even if it's something quite uh, yeah, to be fair actually I, in my latest book I was writing something it, it seems like I'm such a doom merchant about this again it was my father talking about losing his daughter 
Um, right. And I was writing that and he was talking about it. And I did kind of find myself kind of getting kind of tearing up because it was kind of writing all my thoughts and, and fears down. It really was mm. very close. But quite most, a lot of the time, I, <coughs> I can write something very creepy and, 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 and horrible. And then the next minute, you know, my little girl would be mum me and I'm like, yeah, fine, whatever. Should we make some fairy cakes? <laughs> and I find it quite easy to kind of switch off from it. Um, I don't sort of get in too deep, but I think it's <coughs> to get you and draw you in. Um, but fortunately, I'm, yeah, I'm mostly pretty good at just turning it off, I close the laptop and I don't, I don't really think about it past that. Unless, you know, I wake up at two in the morning trying to desperately sort out some kind of plot hole or not that I'm like, oh God, what can I do with this? But, mm. but generally, yeah, I can, I can keep the two very, very separate, which is good. And well, my little- well, I'm not, I'm not the only person that, that does a 2 a.m. wake up, go, oh my gosh, how do I, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna fill this It is always that hole. 2 a.m. saving, you start thinking about it and then that, that's it then, isn't it? It's yeah. like, God, how can I end that bit? And I'll oh, know I've just realized there's a massive plot hole that I need to sort out. Yeah. I did that last <laughs> night, 2 30 in the morning. It was awful. <laughs> so, CJ, from, from what I've read, you're almost the extreme example of a pantser uh, and that you do almost no planning or outlining. Uh, and you just ride where the story takes you. Have you ever gotten really deep into a story and had to abandon it because it wasn't working? Not yet. <laughs> she says yet <laughs> not yet I think that used to be my problem before actually I think I would get myself to that difficult spot in a book mm. and, and 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 rather than trying to work through it I would go oh my god it's too tough I can't write myself out of this and I've got a much better idea and I'll write that instead and actually I've learned now that every book you get to a point where you think oh my god either I, I can't write myself out of this or oh my god this is the worst thing in the world I've ever written <laughs> what, what, was the what was going on and I know that you get there and then you, you get over that hump generally and you can make it all come together. So not yet. Um, I, I've had a few moments with this. I had a few moments with the other people. I do. But then I know, I know now I've had that with every book. I've sat there and gone, I can't make this work. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> Why did I plan it? Um, and then yeah. something just click. It's just, just one thing. Yeah. And that slots into place. And then everything else kind of like, like a stack of dominoes kind of just goes. And you suddenly find you're at the end. And, and I'm always like going, my oh God, how did that happen? I actually managed to finish this thing. So I, and I'm very much at that stage with sort of book four at the moment. I'm just on the final sort of editing bits of that. And it, it's doing a lot of polish. Mm. Um, but yeah, but a few weeks ago, if you'd asked me how book four was going, and I just got, don't talk to me about book four. <laughs> <laughs> don't talk about book four at the moment. <laughs> it's awful, awful. <laughs> um, but I've sort of gone over that phase again. But yeah, but I, I, I couldn't plan. Um, I would A, be really bored before I even started. Mm. And, and B, I think I'd just change it all anyway. Yeah. Because I still, even at this, at this moment, you know, at being at the editing stage really of, of book four and having most of the plot down, I'm still thinking that there are bits that I'm going to tweak and change just to make it a little bit more convoluted and, you know, difficult, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> so I, I am kind of extreme, kind of just changing it as I go along but everybody writes differently don't they sure. and I think it's yeah, for sure. right. you can't well, go from a panster to being a planner and vice versa right. no, I don't think you can I, I tried it I, yeah no, I like I like the experience of discovering how the book unfolds like myself as, as you're as you're yeah. writing the story like that's exciting to me yeah yes for me I like not knowing where it's going of course till I've got to that point where I've got to pull it all together but right. I, don't, I think perhaps if I'm sort of surprising myself with ideas as I go along hopefully that will wrong foot the reader as well because quite often I think I'm going in one direction and I realize I can take it in another direction that I haven't mm. thought of yeah so kind of keeps me on my toes and hopefully mm. hopefully the reader as well because it's well, hard it's hard to fool readers these days sure is well, well clearly it's working for you um <laughs> but your Sorry, is that are... rain bothering you by the can you hear the rain no oh, no oh no no it's absolutely chucking it down here in the window <laughs> Here and it's rain and it's stormy. It's horrible. We'll let you know if the ceiling's caving in behind you. It, it seems yeah, like it starts coming down. By the it way, I've never heard that phrase before. It's like chucking it. I love it. Chucking it, it down. Yeah. <laughs> expression. Chucking it down. <laughs> so to follow, kind of to follow up, your your books are very complex narratives in, in one respect. Um, the other people follow two separate narratives until they intertwine. The yeah. chalk man has a split narrative thirty years apart. Do you have any tricks to keep all that straight in your head <laughs> since you do not plan um, as far as the details of how those stories are going as you're writing them? I, I kind of, I have what I, I call like a mental 
cork board in my head where I kind of like pin things in my brain. Um, <laughs> that kind of seems to work. With the Chalkman, I actually wrote all of the 1986 time period first. And then I wrote the 2016 time period and kind of threaded it in. And I, I found that worked sort of far better. Um, sort of write them as separate chunks and then split them up. Um, but I think my process basically involves a lot of going back and tweaking and editing. So I really just do what I call a vomit draft and just get the skeleton down just to kind of get from A to, you know, to B. And then I kind of go back and then I tweak a lot of things at the beginning. As the plot develops going on, I go, okay, well, this is going to happen. I need to kind of change this back there or maybe mm. drop a few breadcrumbs around that point. Um, and so that's kind of my process, constantly going back and sort of tweaking at the beginning, I think. And then I, I somehow do sort of keep track of all the stuff in my head. Even if I write stuff down, I, I tend to then lose the notes or not look at the notes. Or <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, I, I do kind of just keep it sort of up here. And then there's just an awful, awful lot of editing. And I get my husband, who's quite good at, at being a good sort of first reader, because he's very objective and he's good at sort of, you know, picking up inconsistencies and things um i let him run through it and pick holes in it i'm glad i'm not the only person that does that <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy that's like a really disorganized way to write but i i just can't do it any other way the same way i hear you so so cj sean mentioned uh two of them but now you have three uh published terrific novels your latest the other people Yes. Uh, which is a gripping, suspenseful, and creepy tale. It came out last month. Uh, it followed on the heels of your smash hit, The Taking of Andy Thorne, and your breakout, as we talked about just before, the uh, yeah. debut, The Chalk Man. How does it feel now to have three published books? Uh, do you feel like a writer yet? Or do you, like so many authors that we've talked to, suffer imposter syndrome? Oh, God, yeah, big time. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it still doesn't really feel real. It's really yeah. odd. Um, it seems it feels really strange to say there are two, the, two, three, three published books out there, um, yeah. and there's still this really weird sense of disconnect. If I see my book in a bookshop, it still sort of kind of yeah, it, it doesn't feel, it does feel like it's mine, but it doesn't. It's it's kind of strange, and yeah, I still don't feel I still feel huge imposter syndrome. I don't feel like I'm a proper author yet. I don't know. Nah, you shouldn't. Yeah. Should not at all. Yeah. I still feel like perhaps I've got to, you know, get like, I don't know, 50 books under my belt, but then I'm <laughs> in the face of one a year and I'm 48 now, that probably isn't going to happen. So, yeah, Listen, I feel like I'm supposed to be in double figures or something to be a proper author. And perhaps uh, I'm like, I don't CJ, know. If, if you had written The Chalk Man and, the, and walked away, you, you, would, you would be in a phenomenal author. Yeah, if you just written that one. But now you have these, these two afterwards and it's just, it's icing on the top. Yeah, it gets harder though. I, I had this naive thing that actually it would get easier to write yeah. books, and um, and that's not true. It's really yeah. disappointing to find out that because <laughs> <laughs> you're constantly trying to think. Well, I don't want to disappoint people if they liked that book. I, I, you know, I want them, I hope I want them to like this book, and I hope they won't go. No, it's not as good as. And, and you know, there's always going to be some people that you know, have favourites with books, yeah. but you constantly feel you want to push yourself and, and and make each one better, I guess, and different as well. Because I don't want to kind of keep writing the same thing. Mm -hmm. mm. So, CJ, um, you've found success on both sides of the pond, which is is not not always normal, um, especially in the genre. Um, do you do you see differences between the British readers and the American readers? And then why do you think the story, like say the Chalkman, why do you think it resonated um, if there are differences with, with both audiences? I think with the Chalkman, uh, I think that kind of story set in a small town, gangs of kids, I think you can, you can almost, I think everyone can kind of identify with that. Um, yeah, it could be a small town anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, UK or US it's I think everyone kind of understands and recognizes that kind of experience of, of yeah. gangs of kids growing up so I think that's a very universal thing you know bizarrely or, or perhaps not bizarrely the chalk man's been absolutely huge in Brazil massively big in Brazil really? <laughs> yeah I went to a, a book fair there and it was kind of nuts I had, I had kind of teenage girls kind of like following me and crying and, and oh, they, it, it was just bizarre <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> it was like 150,000 copies or something. It's what? Oh my yeah. And I would not have thought that Brazil would have been a, a country where no. it would resonate, but it just really mm. hasn't, particularly with younger people. Um, mm. So that was a surprise. But I do think some stories are quite universal. Um, and actually, I don't think there's a huge, huge difference between UK and US readers. 
Um, I think, you know, we have a lot of similar benchmarks. Um, <laughs> And, and I think, you know, I think a lot of stories, if it's a mystery, it's about people, you know, all books are essentially about characters and about people. Mm. And we can all sort of identify with, you know, with that, with people and their experiences. Um, so I sort of, you know, I haven't found a huge amount of difference. I found a difference between sort of perhaps how the books are marketed and, and right, covers yeah. and perhaps how the publisher wants to sort of present the book. But when it comes to the readers, um, you know, I've been really lucky. I've got some lovely, lovely, really loyal US readers who are just amazing and it, it's brilliant and, it, and it's yeah, so lovely to sort of know another book so great this guy's a loyal fan reader yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's lovely and you know it's, it, it is so nice but it's, it is fun actually. the readers are different though because you know the UK you know perhaps sticking to stereotype tend to be very much like we, we like your book it's very good yes whereas the same when I went to Brazil and everyone's like I love it I love it <laughs> I love you <laughs> Like kind of going mad. So. <laughs> That's funny. Hey, writers have all the time in the world to write that first book, you know, and make it nice and tidy and perfect yeah. and every in every way. And you kind of alluded to this uh, earlier, where the second and third book, uh, you have that kind of this rust rush sensation on top of feeling like you have to be better than than, than the last one. So, did you get that same sort of feeling when you wrote Taking of Annie Thorn and the other people? Was that, uh, did that kind of, uh, was that your experience? Yeah, I mean, suddenly you're, you know, you're in a, an incredibly privileged position, you know, yeah. that you're, you're under contract. You know, I signed the first two books, then I signed for three and four, and, you know, fingers crossed, yeah. <laughs> we'll be signing right. for five, six soon. But obviously with that comes the pressure of, you know, you're under contract to, to write a book a year. Um, I didn't feel it so much with Annie Thorne because I'd actually written quite a lot of that before the Chalk Monk was published. Um, I was, I was already, I'd already probably got about 70,000 words of that. So I was very lucky. Well, in one way, I didn't have to stare at a blank page and go, oh, God, crumbs, what shall I write now? Right. Um, but I also sort of was kind of committed to that, to that book. Um, I, I didn't feel I could change my mind because I talked to publishers about it and, and it was sort of part of the, the two book deal. I felt it a little bit more with the other people because the thing, I suppose, you, you know, you don't know when you go into it is that it's not just writing books. There's lots of other stuff. There's, there's obviously all sort of the editing and the copy editing and, and more and more editing that happens. Yeah, for people. sure. But then there's obviously the promotion side of things as well. This. And, you know, social media is much more of a big thing now. My gosh. You know, yeah. places for book events. And so you find all of that kind of eats into your writing time. Yeah. And, and I found that, I did find that much more with, with book three. I did feel the pressure more there. And I felt it even more, I think, with book four because because the pressure was on with book three, I maybe handed that in a month later than I would, it was, you know, well within deadline, but I kind of perhaps wanted to finish by the end of the year and it was January. And then you start the next one a little bit later. Yeah. And so now mm. it'll be March when I hand this book in. And I'm like, now I've got to go bang into book five because I want to, you know, I want to finish that in good time. So you do start to feel that pressure creeping in, but at the same point, you have to view it as a job, you know? Yeah. It's not like you can you know, be lounging around, you know, <laughs> you know the it's a job. You've got to get up at nine o'clock, you know, get Betty off to school, go sit down and write for yeah. several hours. And that's, that's the only way a book gets finished, you know. I know sort of, you know, people like to go to writing retreats sometimes or go off and do stuff. But at the end of the day, it's no matter where you are, you've got to sit down at some point in front of your laptop and just get the words down. Just do it. Uh, you know, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There's no, that's no, no lie, magic man. formula, you know, it's not, yeah, no. it's no shortcuts. That is the formula. Sit down. Sit down and write, just write yeah. whatever it is. Just write. I mean, you know, I'm very much of the mind, just write anything. Because some days you'll write absolute rubbish, but at least you've got something to edit. And other days, you days. Know, <laughs> So true. So, it most sticks with me to be fair. So I'm like, just, I'm, I'm, like I'm, I'm like, yeah, editing now. And I say, my first draft is a vomit draft. So I'm the I don't even know what this is supposed to say. <laughs> what was I thinking? I maybe got one usable paragraph out of this whole chapter. But I wrote two thousand words, damn it! Yeah, I, I kept five. <laughs> five words. That's all I kept. <laughs> so going back to your debut uh, in the Chalk Man, you have a split timeline, thirty years apart, and I was extremely kind of blown away by your ability to show both the growth and the stagnation of the characters. Um, how did you go about, and how do you go about in your process, deciding how they've changed and how they've remained the same? I think with the chalk man, as I say, because I wrote it, I wrote the kids' parts first, mm -hmm. uh, and then I wrote them as adults. So in a way, I think that made it easier, 
because mm -hmm. I'd kind of already established their characters as children. And mm -hmm. so I kind of knew what had happened to them and how it had affected them when I came to write the adult characters. And I always had a, I had a really strong idea of sort of Eddie being this kind of man trapped in many ways um, by so many, many things, his past, his sort of obligations, his own fears in this, this small town where he grew up. And, and, I, and I sort of knew the characters who, you know, try and get away from it and those who sort of remain. And so, and I think actually growing up in a, in a small town, I kind of saw a lot of that firsthand as well, because you, you know, you all have friends and expectations when you're children. And it's always interesting to see how those pan out into adulthood, the, you know, the children who do go off and, and do stuff and the ones who perhaps remain in the hometown mm -hmm. and, and don't maybe fulfill, you know, the things that you thought they'd do at school. Um, and I think that's, that's always quite interesting to see. And then, you know, I saw a lot of my classmates, um, some of the children, you know, I kind of had an idea that they would perhaps go off and, and do sort of big things and, and, and stuff. And then, then yet they remained in that small sort of town. And, and, and so it kind of didn't, I'd say fulfilled, because as long as you're happy, that's the main thing. Sure. Perhaps wasn't what you, you thought they would go and do from seeing them at school. And I, I think that's always really sort of interesting. Um, so to see how we sort of, I have this idea that actually we don't really change that much as adults. We're all just kind of those same kids inside. Cause I feel that all the time, you know, mm -hmm. I, ah, I'm sort of a kid who overcame sort of shyness and things, I think by, by sort of forcing myself to be quite outgoing and stuff. And eventually I think you become that person, mm. but the kid who was scared of all those other things is still kind of there buried down. I think I don't think yeah. they ever really go away. You're telling us CJ was a quiet corner dweller? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> well, I think I used to feel really socially awkward in situations. I was always really scared of being embarrassed or saying the wrong thing. Maybe mm -hmm. because of being an only child, actually, you grow up, I don't know, a little bit more sort of, you, you haven't got those brothers and sisters to bounce off. No. But again, that probably helped my writing because I used to live in a complete imaginary world a lot of the time. And I had my own little close knit group of friends. Um, but, but I think, yeah, I, I used to have to sort of force myself to sort of be outgoing and, and, and in social situations. Like a lot of people do. I think writers are a, a weird mix. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm much, I think getting older helps because I don't really care if I make an idiot of myself now. It doesn't bother <laughs> me. But that, that's a great bonus because you just go into anything going, what's the worst that could happen, you know? Right. Well, this show is a prime example of our desire to do that. Yeah. <laughs> what's the worst? As if I make a fool of myself, everyone will have forgotten it tomorrow. So it's, it's not the biggest deal in the world. But yeah. I think you, you learn that as you get older, I think, you know? Yeah. Well, here, here's one of the coolest things. Uh, the Daily Mail has called you Britain's female Stephen King. Ooh. Um, yes. How does it feel to be compared to and celebrated by the master yeah. of horror, who I might add, blurbed your work by saying, if you like my stuff, you'll like this. Yes. Yeah, that, that, feel? that was, that was, I have to, that was probably the best moment of my life. Wow. I kind of have to sort of add on to that, apart from having my daughter and meeting. Yeah, 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 of course. But really, it was the best moment of my life. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I'm, like, I'm a constant reader. I, you know, I've been reading Stephen King since I was 11 or 12. I've read all his books and he's my hero and and it was and it was it was so unexpected because it was just a tweet so I you know I was on a train to London and this tweet pops up because obviously I follow Stephen King right. at the top of my timeline and I started to read it thinking I wonder what he's recommending and then I saw the chalk man and I was just like oh! <laughs> <laughs> so this train, I'm like, oh, 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 it's only my partner, you know, desperately going, guess what, guess what, guess what? Um, yeah, it was, I, I did, I still grin, grin, grin. I, it's, it's amazing. I, I didn't awesome. stop grinning, I don't think, for, for possibly, well, several months. Um, and then I, of course, replied to it just to say thank you very much. And, and the best thing was you replied and just went, you rock. Oh, um, I still oh, get <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was that was just incredible, and and yeah, I mean, when I was used to be a dog walker, I used to, you know, we all have like fantasies when you want to, uh -huh. and you dream of being a published writer. Yeah, I used to walk around imagining having a book published, and ima imagining, you know, in Stephen King might blurb it, and you know, someone would describe me or compare me to Stephen King, and these were all fantasies that I thought, you know, mm. never could ever happen. Um, so it's it's an amazing thing. It's a huge it's a huge honor. Um, so, because you know, he's so awesome and so well deserved. 
Yeah. No, it's so well deserved. Well, I imagine you look forward to the time in your life and your career when you can have that effect on somebody else, and then and then seeing kind of that pass it forward kind of sensation. That's got to be something that you've thought about before. As I say, I think I still have huge imposter syndrome. It's I still find it really weird when people send me proofs and and would like me to blurb them because I'm still very much like really you really care what I think about it. <laughs> Seeing people, you know, seeing blurbs on other people's books is very much like I'm always there thinking. I bet people who put this book about no idea who's CJ. They're like, you know, they're, they're recognizing the other names. They're going, who's this CJ Tudor? So <laughs> CJ is like, yeah, it's awesome. It's it's weird, and I, I'm, 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 but I think it's perhaps you know, if you ever get over the imposter syndrome and you ever do think, my God, you know, I am this great author. Perhaps that's that's possibly the point that you know you've you've lost it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I don't right. know. I think once you've got imposter syndrome, you you're going to keep wanting to try to be better, aren't you? And be a yeah. good author, be a proper author, as I say. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of getting the interaction with Stephen King, getting the praise from him, so I uh, we all met at Thriller Fest last summer, the four of us, and I actually met you, albeit briefly. Um, I think you were on the panel with Jack, which was for the yep. uh, debut yes. novel. Yeah. And I, I took a picture of you and Jack. Um, so that was my, that was my claim of fame. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So which was which was awesome. So tell us about your Thriller Fest experience, because we all go and we all have very um, varied experiences. Normally pretty dynamic. But what was it like for you? And and as an author who's normally, you know, as you were saying, having to get it done, sit at the laptop and write. What is it yeah. like for you to go to the conferences and have to be out on display and, and to sell yourself essentially. So I mean that this I enjoy it actually. I mean I like I like meeting other authors. I think it helps that everybody's really nice and everyone's there for sort of the same reason. They love writing, they love books. You know, it's a bit like these are my people. So it's you know the experience is generally really good. Um, and you know other authors, it sounds sort of a cheese thing to say, but the crime writing community is really full of lovely people who are very supportive. I'm sure there are people who are not so nice, but fortunately I've not yet met them. Um, and everybody's really lovely. And yeah, everyone likes to drink as well, which is always good. Yeah. So it was generally a very good crack and a good party. And Thriller Fest was great. I mean, panels, I, yeah, everyone gets a little bit nervous, I suppose, when, they, when they're sort of on panels, particularly perhaps, you know, with, with other authors who are sort of perhaps more well-known, who are a bit like, yikes. And I sat next to Karen Slaughter, I was terrified. But <laughs> it was actually, it was really good. And I, you know, I think once you get into talking about the books, I mean, I, I always have a thing with panels where it's like, I know I've got to talk about the book and I want to make the book sound interesting, but I don't want to feel like I'm there trying to sell it to people, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I can't just want to provide them with some, you know, entertaining experience and, and, and have a nice chat about it all, really. Um, so I enjoy it. I always used to say when, when I was first asked if I wanted to go onto panels, I was like, look, for 10 years, trust me, you know, people have not wanted to hear about my writing. It's like, yes, yes we get it. You're trying to write a book. So, you know, I will take my moment and talk to people about my writing. <laughs> that is good with me. If it makes you feel any better, Karen, if it makes you feel any better, Karen Slaughter terrified me as well. <laughs> She's quite scary. <laughs> She's, hilarious. She's funny though. She's so funny. Very funny. She's very dry, that kind of very yes. dry kind of humor. And you're like, I'm not sure if she's joking or not. I think I better laugh. <laughs> it works for her, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, she was, she was really held, nice me, I was a bit scared. A bit like Valentine. Yeah, I think we all were. So you've held quite a number of jobs in the past. Yeah. Um, and one of the more interesting ones that I read about was that you were the host of a show where you rub shoulders with some really very famous people um, from all over the world. Yes. Um, without naming names, I mean, we would all know who they were. Did any of those experiences you had with those individuals um, have an influence on how you deal with your current fans in the press? Did you learn anything from them? Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a show called Movie Watch. So, you know, it was, it was a movie review show. So I used to get sent to a lot of press junkets. Um, and, and you know, they're, they're kind of like weird things because basically you've got these actors and actresses plugging a film and they've sat in a hotel room for days on end and like journalists and TV people are wheeled in for sort of five or six minutes of time to do an interview. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, to fit, nearly all of them, well, yeah, pretty much all of them without exception um, were very gracious and, and gave their time. And, and I, I was always given like sort of quite 
off sort of quite silly questions to ask. It was quite sort of a light-hearted show. They didn't want to ask the same sort of serious, boring questions. Um, and most people just took it in good part. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's always good to sort of see people who have to do this sort of thing all the time, just be professional and nice and kind, you know, and because yeah. I was very new to it, so I was very nervous. And I sort of was like, yeah, I'm sort of, yeah, I'm sort of, this is kind of the first time I've done anything like this. <laughs> so I'm really nervous. And, and, and they were all really lovely. Um, so, so I think it's, it's like anything, isn't it? I think, you know, I don't think of myself as particularly different to anybody who comes up to me and wants to talk about a book I've written because I'm still a reader and I'm still in awe of other authors. I mean, when I was at Thriller Fest, I was a big Harlan Coben fan. Um, and my husband and I were coming up the escalators and he was sort of stood at the top, I think he was waiting for his wife. And I saw him and I was like, oh my God, it's Harlan Coben. But then I was like, so overcome. I couldn't go straight up to him. So I like, I hid behind a pillar. <laughs> really embarrassing. Because like, he, he saw me hide behind the pillar. I mean, you know. <laughs> I was sort of like, oh, I got myself together. And I sort of came out. Was like, hi, I'm <laughs> really big fan. And then he was just because he's so cool. Anyway, he's like, yeah. DJ, it's really nice to me. I'm like, oh, it's why I'm not so <laughs> So I, I get completely starstruck. I mean, God, I, I better never meet Stephen King because honestly, I, I'd make the biggest fool of myself in the world. I'd probably oh, just, you know. <laughs> hyperventilate and melt into some kind of puddle but I get I get really starstruck still as well um but yeah. I don't I don't think I'm, I, I'm just a reader so I'm always really surprised when people are like oh my gosh it's really exciting to meet you I'm like really <laughs> honestly yeah that's so cool we all, so, I think we all feel the same way though don't we I mean yeah, yeah. yeah. okay was just lovely though. he just said the coolest man then he was at Harrogate the festival in um in the UK the big crime festival there and you're just kind of hanging around, strolling around the bar, because it must be so tall as well. Yeah. It's just like, you can, you can always see him coming, and he's just got this really cool persona, and he's so nice with everybody. Like, all the women were just like, <laughs> oh. I went so, to get a picture with him at the end of one of his panels, and he was at the big, one of the big stages, so I went up, and I had to stand up the three steps that come off the stage, so I could be, like, eye level with him, so. It's all that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so going back to uh, the other people, did you have any uh, personal, real-world uh, inspiration for this book? The start of the book is, is like a lot of things that I write, was based upon a real experience okay. uh, that I was driving home. We used to travel a lot to visit relatives over the other end of the country. So we spent a lot of time on the motorway. Um, and we were driving back late one night, and it was really slow-moving traffic, and we were stuck in this traffic jam. And we'd been following this same car for miles and it was this kind of just really old beaten up car i couldn't even tell what model it was and it did have all these old stickers around sort of the rear window right. just bizarre some were sort of just the not connected stickers it was all just a bit weird and i was staring at it thinking that car's really weird there's just something odd about it and you, you couldn't really see the drive you could just see the sort of silhouette and then yeah you, my mind started thinking i started thinking wow what if what if there was something that car being kidnapped what if someone's face appeared in that rear window yeah, a little girl. <laughs> Kidnapped. Well, that was it. It started with just a face. Then I thought, what if it was someone I knew? And then, of course, yeah, tumbled down the rabbit hole to the darkest place. I thought, what if it was my little girl? What if my little girl was in this strange car in front of me? And, and I was driving home one night, and, and she shouldn't be there. She should be at home. And right. what's going on? And what would I do? And it just seemed like a really good starter for a book. You know, where do, where do you go from that? And then the idea that perhaps, you know, it, it turns out that, you know, the little girl and her mother were murdered right. that night, but the father thinks that he saw his little girl in that car at that moment. Um, and the mystery kind of spiraled from there. And then my idea about the other people. Um, and it also it started to tie together. But I think, you, you, you know, you have to have a starting point for a book. And that's one idea. And it, and it could have been a very sort of relatively straightforward kind of thriller. But then that doesn't, that doesn't interest me. I like to I'm like, so where can I go from here? And what else can I throw into the mix? And what can I do to make this more interesting to the reader, really, as well? So that's, we have the other, the mother and daughter on the run and what's happening with them. And this strange sort of group on the dark web called the other people. And of course, this, this mysterious girl who's lying in this, in a coma, we don't know what, in this white right. room. We don't know what's going on with her either. And then build all those strands together and link them. Um, and and that, that seemed to make it more fun. And obviously it made it much more difficult for me as a writer. Yeah. <laughs> why not? And then, yeah, I was like, why did I do this? <laughs> but but well, I love how it's that, easy, one, right? that one little thing. It just yeah. sparks this entire story. 
can spark it. Um, and it, you, and you never sort of know where it's going to come from. And, and if I ever have like the idea that come, I always go and sort of write the first chapter straight away while that idea is kind of fresh. And also to see, I suppose, if it's got legs, if that first ch chapter really then leaps off the page, I know I can, I can do something with it. Hmm. And that, folks, is the end of our formal question of CJ Tudor. And now we're going to move on to something a little bit more, a um, little bit more unique in what we call the lightning round, where oh. me and the uh, three other guys are going to answer, uh, ask you a whole bunch of silly questions that we hope you give us silly answers to. Oh God! Um, and, okay. And I'm going to start <laughs> first. Um, so this one is actually not that silly, but if you were forced to have. Uh, it's forced to write uh, a novel with, with a co-author, with someone else. Who would you pick? Oh, crumbs. Um, well, obviously, I would, you know, first, first pick would obviously be Stephen King. Yeah. Um, that, that's right. unlikely to happen, isn't it? Probably. Um, I'm probably but, but after that, I think probably my second pick would be a writer called Michael Marshall. Okay. Oh, who I also good. love. I love his work as well. Um, good picks, good picks. You know, or Harlan I mean, I'm there if any of them want to call me. <laughs> I think Chris is saying, hey, third or fourth pick, he's going to raise his hand and say, 733. Uh, why not? <laughs> so let me, now this one's a little bit more sillier. What happens when you get scared half to death twice? You're dead. <laughs> No, I say, I, I say 75%. Dead. 75% because half of half. Strong point. That's why I became a writer. <laughs> you're incapacitated. <laughs> oh, CJ. Um, and so my next one is a two-part question. Uh, do you have a favorite cereal? No. I don't like cereal very much. Okay, good. Uh, um, I have a toast, toast and marmalade girl. Okay. But well, yep. let me ask you that, because um, this is this is uh, something that's been pinging around in my head. Is cereal soup, and uh, why or why not? Well, I mean, it could be, couldn't it? It could be. You could call it cold soup, couldn't you? Right? I mean, anything yeah. could be. My little girl likes to like to make ice cream melt, and then she calls it ice cream soup. I, so I did that as a kid too. I, I, yeah. I still do that. Yeah. <laughs> now I, now so, I can't wait. Really? <laughs> so I ask my kids every morning what they want for breakfast, and my son will be like, I want eggs. And then my daughter will go, I have cereal soup. You get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Eric, so I think you're up. I am up. So, uh, CJ, considering where you live, this is a serious question. Considering where you live, have you ever met the sheriff? <laughs> 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 no, I I twofold here. Actually, no, I haven't. Though I have seen her quite up close because it was a female sheriff, I think, while I was living in Nottingham. Mm, nice. We've just moved from Nottingham, actually, so I am no longer in in Nottingham, in Sherwood oh. Forest anymore. I have yeah. moved to Sussex, which is also great because it's it's another it's another cool place that's full of like really weird legends and, yeah, and kind of stories. Mm. And like book four is kind of based on a lot of that because. In, there was there's a big sort of history in Sussex that when Mary the first was uh, was kind of in charge of everything, she wanted to round up all the Protestants and make them become Catholic. And if they didn't, she just burnt them. Yeah. And, and Sussex has got lots of Sussex martyrs who were like burnt at the stake. They're oh. really really proud of their burnt martyrs here. So that's kind of like <laughs> part of Book Four. <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, when I was reading your background, I was like. She lives in like the most famous place in England if you're a writer. I mean, how do you not know where that is? So that was so cool. Um, another serious one. So what is the greatest British band? Oh, mm. crumbs. Mm. Um, oh, God. I can't I can give a quick five. You see, I think overall you'd probably have to say the Beatles. Yeah, sure. Yes, you would. Absolutely. <laughs> I think. Not a bad answer. Personal favourites. I'm a big fan of a band called The Killers. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I love The Killers. I love The Killers. Yeah. But I think if you're talking kind of over generations, it's got to be The Beatles, really. Yeah. So I'll follow that up with, and this is an inside joke from one of our earlier episodes. But what's the greatest Canadian band? I'm <laughs> gonna go with Rush. Rush. Oh, crumbs. Rush. <laughs> I say Rush. 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 R U S H. No, the, it's okay. You you were forgiven. The, the the person who was who did not answer that question in any way, shape, or form was a Canadian. Was Canadian. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it, it had no clue. 
<laughs> Actually, I think he said he doesn't even listen to music. <laughs> yes, I'm pretty sure. I hope he hears this episode. This will be special yes, for him. Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my final question, um, Adam Hamdy has told us what type of British desserts he fancies. So my question to you is, oh, yes. what type of American desserts do you fancy? Oh, thank God. <laughs> oh, God, I'm not because of strictly American dessert. I'm a big fan of Burnoffy pie. Now, is that strictly an American dessert? What is it? Oh, obviously not then. I always thought it was. <laughs> See, I'm not even up on my desserts. <laughs> my excuse here, though, is you have to let me go. I'm not a big dessert person. I'd That's rather okay. have the cheese. cheese. Um, really? Wait dessert. a minute, you're British. Yeah. <laughs> I know, oh, I know, you see. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just rubbish like that. <laughs> if I have to have a sweet dessert, cheesecake. Okay. okay. There we go. Well, see, she combined the two. That's a great choice. Yeah, That's absolutely. Right. It's all about the cheese with me. That's right. <laughs> All right, me next. Has the sting of losing the American colonies got it any better for you? <laughs> sorry, I did, sorry, I didn't catch that one, sorry. <laughs> Has the sting of losing the American colonies gotten any better for you? <laughs> <laughs> Never gotten over it. Never gotten uh, over it, I'm afraid. No. Yeah, um, you, you seem disappointed. You've already heard all about Brexit. <laughs> We're gonna make Britain great again. <laughs> We've I heard a little think, bit about I, that. I think that's what they want, you know? Yeah. Brexit is. So yeah, they've, they've never gotten over it. They're, they're still still stinging from it. Yeah, yeah, understood. <laughs> they, have, they haven't. They still not accepted the fact that we're quite a small little island, <laughs> <laughs> shrinking all the time. All right, your novels deal in creepy situations and death. Mm. Have you ever considered ramping up the tension in your novels uh, by writing about a missing, completed manuscript computer file? <laughs> <laughs> My God, that would be bad, wouldn't it? Oh. Oh. Back up, back up, back up. <laughs> I know, it's just that worst fit. It's like when you sometimes like, you not delete something because you can get that back, but you save over something. Yeah. Oh, and you're man. like, no! <laughs> I Six months. I've got to rewrite it. <laughs> yeah, that seems like the ultimate, that seems like the ultimate book right there. I do know someone who had like something go wrong with their laptop. It was something really bad and they, they lost like loads and loads of stuff. They'd oh my gosh. I'm not sure they were able to retrieve it all. They were just like, oh my God, that is, that is the worst nightmare, isn't it? Oh. But, you, know, you're, you, know, you know what I do? I do every night I, after I'm done writing, I save it as a PDF and I email it to myself. Yeah, I did that quite a lot. Now it's yeah. kind of up in the cloud. Neil always tells me I can get it back from the cloud, but I'm often a little suspicious. I'm always like, right. what if that goes down? Yeah. Well, Maybe there's no cloud. <laughs> I can't see the cloud. I got to see it. <laughs> All right, my Dang. last question, and this one is going to set some hair on fire here. The queen has placed you in a precarious situation and commands you to rename the dessert Spotted Dick. <laughs> Henceforth, the delectable treat shall be known as what? <laughs> Oh. See how serious these questions it's are. It's sexist, isn't it, Spotted Dick? Really? Yeah, it is, like, completely. You would think so. It's so quite gender we neutral. Have, like, Spotted Doris or something. We could, we, could make it, yeah, we, could, we should make it a female dessert for a while. A Spotted <laughs> Doris. Spotted. That's what it should be. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, like that's that. a I might actually try answer. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm with Sean. Spotted Doris? Yeah, I'll have yeah. it. Yeah. Spotted Dick. Not a fan. No. Never tried Their it. sales would skyrocket in America. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'm going to pass. I'm going to yeah. pass on the other dessert. <laughs> we'll let Adam. We'll, we'll let Adam know that we're switching up uh, the uh, the. Adam's heart's going to be broken when he hears oh. this. So. Okay, my my first question is kind of a callback to your TV days. Um, who has the better chest, Robert Downey Jr. or Susan Sarandon? <laughs> Well, you see, despite my best questioning of Tim Robbins, we, we never really got an answer. <laughs> God, that was that was that was traumatic. Uh, so I, I'm not having obviously, you know, really experienced it up close and personal. <laughs> whereas, whereas I did with Robert Downey Jr. I'd have to say Robert Downey Jr. That's so crazy, right? Iron, like, Iron Man's chest is. I best. think CJ was the original a lightning round question. Yeah, exactly. she was. That sounds like a lightning round question. It does. <laughs> oh God, that was that was so so strange. Um, God, God love it. God Makes bless for good him. TV though. Makes yeah. for good TV. Oh yeah. Okay, now 
my question also, next question is, do you go by CJ because you got sick to death of the song Sweet Caroline? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, but because everybody actually calls me Kaz. So very That's few it. people call me Caroline, apart from my mum. But my mum calls me Caroline because she comes from the south of um, yes. the UK in Wiltshire. So they all speak like that down there. So <laughs> I am sweet Caroline to my mum. Um, so no, it, it, it wasn't. But, but yeah, that song does occasionally crop up. Yeah, <laughs> occasionally. But four shows not- the so it was all good. <laughs> my last question. We're thinking about, we're, we're trying to develop our show. So we're thinking about starting a dark website called The Other Crew. <laughs> um, what what favor would you like us to do for you? Um, well, if you could make sure all my books go to number one in ah. best of the future, that that would be great. Um, and, and yeah, introduce me to Mr. King, so I can embarrass okay. myself. Oh. That's uh, <laughs> one and two done. We, we 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 can get we we can help with one. That's what we're doing. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'd like to introduce ourselves to Mr. King about as, what I have as to well. Do in <laughs> That, and that survived, CJ guys. is the end of the lightning round. You have survived. You, uh, <laughs> your your book, the other people, is out now. It's available everywhere books are sold. It's fantastic. It's creepy. It's horror filled. It's got some paranormal stuff into it. Everybody <laughs> should go out and buy it. Buy it. Thank you. <laughs> we want to thank you for spending the. Uh, it's actually a Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening for you. We want to thank you for spending is, the time yeah, with us. Now I have to wrestle my little girl to try and get her. To try and get her go to sleep at some point. Again, turn <laughs> off the games. Take away right. the iPod. Yeah, the two-hour well, process. We're yeah, we're gonna raise it. it does. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna raise a glass to you, oh, and thank you God. very much for taking the time yes. and being with us. Wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So we want to thank CJ Tudor for coming on the show today, talking about her fantastic and terrific career, and also her latest book the other people which is available now everywhere where books are sold it's creepy it's suspenseful it's everything you expect in a cj tutor book and boys let's raise a glass Mm -hmm. short and sweet short and sweet another good one and we'll see everybody on the next crew reviews on monday out Totally gonna hide you bastards. (laughs) (laughs) No, I stop it. (laughs) I'm totally covering up everybody. Waka waka waka. Not the first time, because you have to you have to enjoy the sensation of what it's like to not. No, I don't like it. It's not nice. (laughs) Oh, I know. (laughs) I don't like it. It makes for great shows. No, it doesn't. (laughs) Makes me feel very uncomfortable. Does everybody have their drink handy just in case? All right, this is the outro for CJ Tudor, and Chris is not going to read. This will be a new take on his abilities. In three, two, game. <laughs> I'm not even looking at you guys. <laughs> See, you're looking for help, and we're the wrong. I'm looking out the window. <laughs> we're the other people. Your cat's right, out there, right. like, hey, let me so- in. Here we go. Three, two, three, two, three, two. Yeah. We want to thank CJ Tudor for coming on the show today. Uh, No, you're reading. (laughs) He's reading. (laughs) We just want, we just want to thank you for coming on the show today and get our book. These two over here. I think now. Twitter, Twitter. To do. Don't All right. Twitter. We want to thank CJ Tudor for coming on the show today. Uh, talk about her, her writing career, her latest book, The Other People, which is available everywhere. So go out and buy it. It's awesome. It's creepy. It's suspenseful. It's everything you would expect in a CJ Tudor book. Um, and folks, please go see our other shows. <laughs> <laughs> and there oh, it so- is. It was there so it nice is. and easy for the longest time. Like, and there it is. Also, it became like a Mr. Rogers show. <laughs> Be nice to your friends because... <laughs> it's the transition. 
<laughs> it is transition. It is because you want to send people to our stuff, and you. I'm send not gonna straight to the. I'm so looking up and seeing an Amish guy and freaking out. Suddenly, the, like, what suddenly the, the tone changed. I was like, and folks, <laughs> I shaved, I don't know. shaved Amish man. Shaved right. Amish. <laughs> and I won't say where. That was beautiful. Uh huh. See how these you, are gonna, these are gonna be like three and a half seconds at some point where we'll be like, come listen to our show. Take care. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, you know what? Screw it. <laughs>